both hear and see me. Um, yeah, I'm briefly going to uh, present to you the structure of the talk. I'm going to start by uh, motivating um, the topic that I will deal with today. Um, I will then go through the theory and um, and briefly describe three competing explanations for why it is that men and women uh, so systematically chose, choose uh, different fields of study in college. I will then uh, give you a very, very brief sketch of the state of research and what I think are the desiderata that my um, research partly fills. I'm going to also present you my research design and then I'm going to spend quite a lot of time giving you descriptive results, and I will use these simultaneously to, um, to explain my measurements. And I will do this in conjunction so uh, you don't get bored. Um, and then I, I, I present you my multivariate results, which also neatly summarize the, the, the main findings. Um, and then I'm also going to uh, go into uh, a little bit more than usual depth talking about the limitations of my research and what I think uh, where this should be taken further. So this is kind of important. This paper is already published, so you might think, what's the point of uh, giving comments to this? There actually is even a stronger point because I'm calling for a replication, and this is an opportunity uh, not just for me to, to learn from you, but this is something you can think about how to improve this and then go and, and do, do these things better. Okay, so <clears throat> the less... Uh, theorizing way to put the research question of, of this uh, paper is really why is it that men and women um, select other majors in college than men? And more specifically, do they choose other fields of study because they want to or because they have to? And this is an interesting question for a number of reasons. So um, the fact that men and women study different fields of study in college accounts for up to 70% of the gender wage gap of the highly educated. Um, so this is, this is a strong motivation in itself. But also, um, you know, we tend to approach these, um, these, these, these uh, decompositions of the gender wage gap in a way that we sort of account for differences in occupations or in fields of study. And then what remains, the residual, is normatively problematic, whereas the stuff we've explained away is unproblematic. Now, there is an, there is an implicit assumption under this, and this is that the differences in occupations or in fields of study really come from free choices that are mostly motivated by, by people's, people's preferences. But if I were to find today that really these differences um, can be rooted back to constraints rather than preferences, then I think this, this, um, this routine of how we interpret these uh, residuals, uh, how we interpret the explained part, um, has, has to partly be revoked. This is also an important, so, so distinguishing between preferences and constraints is also important because it matters for predicting the future levels of occupational sex segregation. And this is uh, going back to a paper of Grasky in Lebanon is actually 10 years old now, but it just came out in, a, uh, in ASR, in a, in a, in a sort of um, um, fully fleshed out version. And they argue um, basically that if differences in occupational choice are due to preferences or to es essentialist preferences, then these are likely to continue to exist. Um, so therefore, this, this, this distinction is also quite important. OK. Um, I will now go through three different theoretical explanations that locate the main reason for um, sex segregation in college in three different domains. And these can, can be categorized into uh, cultural explanations, um, explain second explanations that locate the reasons more in the household. So this would be the, the separate spheres explanation, um, or uh, root these in employer discrimination. And I'm going to start with, uh, with the essentialist argument. Um, and as you can see, I will distinguish um, between a preference-based version of this argument and a constraint-based version of this argument. So the preference-based argument is so, so, so sort of heavily invested in, in a socialization theory, which argues that in an essentialist gender culture as ours, um, Boys and girls during childhood and adolescence pick up 
this essentialist gender culture and internalize it by developing systematically different vocational interests. So that, for instance, boys are, by the, by the time they get to choose their field of study, more heavily interested in uh, technical tasks, whereas girls tend to be more interested in, in, in social or artistic tasks. Um, but the important thing to note here is that this kind of argument believes that this essential gender culture is internalized. There's a second version of, of the essentialism argument, and this is often referred to in, in texts, but it's not so often um, tested empirically. And here it is argued that it's actually not necessarily the case that uh, boys and girls internalize this gender culture, but they perceive it as a constraint in their social environment. Um, and th this uh, frames uh, gender atypical choices as a form of deviant behavior that is suppressed by um, um, a lack of um, a social, how should I put this, um, social reward for people who to take atypical um, choices. Okay, the separate spheres conjecture can also be a distinct, we can also distinguish a preference-based version and a constraint-based version. Um, this argues that the preference-based version would argue that men and women internalized um, traditional breadwinner and mother roles uh, during childhood and during adolescence. Um, and that because, because that is the case, men place more weight on the earnings potential of college majors um, because this is more consonant with their breadwinner role than women do. Um, but we can also think of a constraint-based version where it's not necessarily the case that this all goes deeply into preferences. But it may just as well be the case that uh, women anticipate the time and the role conflict that comes that will come with motherhood later on in life, and um, avoid those majors that lead into segments of the labor market um, that are characterized by a heavy overwork culture, because other fields make it more easier for them to to simultaneously combine the motherhood role and the worker role. Okay, the. The third argument that I'm uh, going to look at is anticipated discrimination. This is also a mechanism that is often referred to in the literature, but rather rarely tested. Um, it's not possible to make this neat distinction here, because it's really hard to argue that there would be a preference-based version of this. This is just a constraint-based argument um, that goes back to Gary Becker, and that basically says that um, minorities um, um, uh, would avoid those segments of the labor market where they have to anticipate particularly heavy discrimination. And this should also hold for um, gendered uh, study choices. OK, um, this, is a, this is a reduction. Um, but the current state of research, I think it's fair to say, argues that gender differences in choices are almost entirely mediated by gender differences in educational or ed uh, occupational orientations. Um, so this is basically goes down to um, the finding that when, when students are asked at the age of 16, 17, in which occupation do you expect to work in when you're 30 or 35 years old, then they will, uh, for instance, uh, respond with nurse. And from that, we can quite well predict uh, what, what people will study. The problem I see with, with this kind of approach is that most of the times the orientations are operationalized through expectations. And it's not really clear what these expectations tell us, whether they tell us that people actually want to or because they have to, because you can just adopt your expectations to, your, to, to the constraints you face. A second uh, um, um, desiderata here is that gendered social norms are, are almost never um, observed. So it's basically impossible to distinguish these two types of essentialism arguments. Um, and there's a, a focus on broad fields of study. So that often these um, studies go about and, and, and just look at whether individuals choose a STEM field or not a STEM field. Or sometimes they look at more broad uh, 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 categories. But I will look at detailed majors. Um, so <clears throat> this is the classical research design, if you want. So the idea here is that x, a person's gender, 
causes some other individual traits, such as uh, interest in mathematical tasks or technical tasks. And then this interest leads a person to choose one field or another, a more or less male typical field, for instance. Now, the problem with this is obviously that there could be some confounder, that it, it's not actually this interest, but something else that is confounding this relationship, and that we don't actually have this causal relationship here. And the, um, the, the conventional approach how to go about this is, well, make this unobserved variable an observed variable and control for it to rule out that kind of confounding. I'm taking a little bit of a different approach here. The fancy term for this would be front door conditioning. <clears throat> and so my, my idea here is that I look at the, the causal variable that mediates the effect of I on Y um, and thereby rule out this kind of confounding, not through conditioning on these unobserved variables, but um, by making more explicit the, 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 the exact causal mechanism that is supposedly driving what we're looking at here. Okay, um, that my empirical strategy is to construct college major characteristics uh, from a number of sources, and these are the His graduate panel studies, um, and data from the German microcensus, as well as from the National Educational Panel Study. Um, I measure individual characteristics and choices for um, college entrants that entered college in 2010, um, exclusively relying on the NEPS. And I fit uh, conditional logit models uh, to this data to test whether individual character characteristics actually affect the choice of college majors with those specific characteristics that are suggested by the theory. Um, and I decompose horizontal sex segregation in what is a, basically a straightforward mediation analysis. OK, so how do I operationalize all these complicated theories? This is actually where most of my thought went into. Um, I will start off with the basic fact that I'm trying to explain or explain away here. And this is something every one of you is aware of, that men and women study very much different fields of study. So for instance, electrical engineering is a really, really heavily male-dominated uh, field with, um, with only about 10% uh, of, of women in that field, whereas the opposite is true of a uh, field of uh, college majors such as pedagogy, psychology, or social work. So this is, this is really what, everyone, what we all know. Um, Let's, let's go to the, to, the, um, to the explanations. So essentialist preferences I operationalize through the so-called RIASEC scores. This is a psychological metric um, that breaks down a, a people's um, vocational interests into, three, uh, into six dimensions. And in the NEPS, these were uh, actually um, asked through separate items, and we have three items for each of these dimensions. So I'm, go I'm give, just going to give you the example for the so-called R dimension, the realistic dimension. These are sort of practical, technical tasks. And their um, respondents were asked, <clears throat> how much are you interested in creating things from metal or wood, creating something according to a plan or a sketch, building or assembling things? Now, I just... Um, construct uh, six composite indices for each of these six uh, RIASEC uh, dimensions and use these as measures for people's uh, essentialist preferences in a way. And uh, these are the results we see. At least I see, and I can explain to you <laughs> what it is to be seen here. So this is the realistic dimension, the investigative dimension, the artistic dimension, the social dimension, the enterprising, and the conventional dimension. And where we expect to see from, based on the theory where we would expect to see the strongest um, gender differences would be, for instance, in the realistic dimensions. <clears throat> so, and we actually do see, so the men are on top, the women are here in the, in the bottom uh, row. We do see that men much more heavily indicate that they're interested in these realistic tasks than, than females do. Um, we also see this with these in so-called investigative uh, tasks, which are analytical tasks men score much, much, much more highly on, on this dimension than women do. We see the opposite, but this is also totally consonant with the theory with regards to artistic tasks. 
So uh, uh, females indicate much more often that they're really interested in artistic tasks than, than, than men do. Um, there is a heavy difference in, in the social dimension. So women much more often indicate that they're interested in, in social uh, vocational tasks. But we see hardly any differences uh, with regards to this enterprising dimension and the conventional. So this is sort of bureaucratic tasks. Uh, putting things into a folder, I think, is one of the items here. Um, OK, so this would be the individual, the individual um, uh, characteristic. But I want to look at how these individual characteristics match with major characteristics. So I construct two dimensions that characterize majors. And one is the math intensity of majors. The idea is, for instance, that um, people with these analytical tasks should be much more prone to choose math intensive majors. And um, I draw this measure from, from the National Educational Panel study, where after one semester, respondents were asked, in your studies, how much are abilities and knowledge in the following domains needed? Math. Um, and this is the proportion of respondents who, who answered uh, very much or, or rather much. And what you see is, is also you know, pretty much what we would all expect, that in social work or in the arts, but also in law, you hardly need any math at all, whereas in physics and um, electrical engineering, you do need it all the time. Um, yeah. So this, this, this is sort of how I operationalize the preference-based version of essentialism theory. And we'll now move on to the constraint-based version. And this, remember, is the idea that individuals get sanctioned. There's a gender bias to the kind of social approval that people can expect when they choose a field of study. And um, here I found an item in the, in the HIS graduate panel study um, where person, or, or this is from MEPS. I think I have to correct myself, and this is from MEPS. Um, this is where, where, where respondents were asked whether their friends think that they choose a good, good field of study. And I here plot the proportion of respondents who answered with uh, fully agree or rather agree. And I computed the different score for the, for this, for the responses I, uh, uh, they got from men and from women. From women. It's actually, it's the other way around. So this is the response women gave, and this is the uh, response men gave. And what we see is, for instance, that for social work, females get more social approval from their friends than men do. And for computer science, the reverse is true. And I listed them, I ranked them by this difference. So the broad picture falls in line with, with, with what we would expect, especially at the extremes. But then you will also see that there are some cases which do not fit exactly with, with how we, of what we would expect. I also looked at the responses for parents, and uh, the picture is quite different here. Uh, first of all, I want to notice that approval from parents is generally higher than from, from friends. It's kind of hard to make your parents unhappy. There are two ways to do it. Become an artist or become a sociologist. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but the gender difference is not, is not too big with these, in, in, in this respect. And the patterns don't fall in line very much with what we would expect. Um, so this is this is sort of uh, a first uh, warning sign that that, that maybe uh, this constraint-based version will not explain too much with regards to parents' norms. With regards to friends' norms, maybe some more potential. Um, we now turn to this to the separate spheres argument, the the preference-based. So there are strong differences across fields in the, in the earnings you can expect from such fields. This is also not too surprising, um, so I will go over this quite quickly. But for the mechanism to play out in the way that, um, that, that the theory would predict, we would also have to um, have individuals stating with a strong gender bias in how much they actually care about remuneration in the fields that they, that they choose to pick. And I plot here the, the item from MEPS um, where, there, where respondents were actually asked about this, and we see that there is not, not much of a gender difference at all. So this basically already at this stage rules out that this um, theory will explain 
uh, any great deal. Um, the constraint-based version was about overwork. And I uh, here used information from the German microcensus, where um, respondents in the age range of 25 to 55 who work full time were, uh, um, were asked how many hours per week they work. So I only look at those who work full time to see how much of an overwork culture there is in these fields. And what we see is that there is not very much <clears throat> of, um, of, of variation. Um, pedagogy and social work tend to have somewhat lower working hours. And there's one outlier, more or less, or two law and especially the medical sciences. Now, I also compared this with an item from the His Absolventen panel, where um, persons who are already five years into the labor market were asked how dissatisfied they are with the compatibility of work and private life, which corresponds quite well in, these ex in this extreme case, at least. So the, so the doctors are not only work a lot, but they're also really unhappy with how much they work. Um, and this lends some validity to this measure, I would, I would, I would say. Now again, um, I, I, I looked for an individual measure that would match with, with, this, uh, with this field characteristic, and that is um, how important pleasant working hours are to, to, to individuals. And here, well, we again see really not very much of a difference. You might want to interpret a little bit into this but I don't think these are strong differences at all. And at last, from the, um, again, from the His Absolventen panel, I used um, an item where persons who are in the labor market already were asked, which of the following criteria do you deem important to be successful when searching for a job? And I only take the, the responses from women um, who state that the right gender matters when finding a job in their fields of study. And there we see quite strong uh, differences, but also these don't fall in line entirely with the expectations. But what, what I think is interesting is, for example, state teachers. So this is a really highly bureaucratic, um, highly formalized way of finding a job. They, they state this rarely. <coughs> Whereas, for example, for medical doctors or mechanical engineers, we hear this more often. Um, yeah. I now jump to the multivariate results. Um, these are not the final results yet. So we see that many of the descriptive findings basically fall in line rather well with the, with the predictions. So this actually motivates a multivariate analysis where we still have to run it. Um, but this, what, what you see here, is still testing the premises of these arguments. It's whether the differences that we saw actually impact which fields people choose. Um, so the coefficients are kind of hard to give a very uh, intuitive uh, um, interpretation to them. So I will, I will briefly go through this. We, for instance, we see that um, people with a realistic interest, net of all the other uh, influences, uh, tend to, no, I should, I should say something more about this. So this is the conditional logic model. Um, I should say that. I have netted out major fixed effects because what I want to explain here is not which fields, why people choose certain fields or why certain fields are more popular in general. I want to net out the general size of, of majors and just look at, given the size of a major, what gender differences are there in the popularity of fields. And I just want to explain these gender differences. And these are the, the mechanisms and we see that with regard to most of these um, the vocational preferences, they fall in line with the expectations. And I've hi I'm highlighting these uh, corroborating findings with green. Um, we also see, for instance, that women tend to study more often the fields, met of the other influences, where they can expect to get higher social approval than men. And the, 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 the vice versa, this is also, I mean, you can read this in the other way around, that men are more likely to choose fields where they get more higher approval rates. Um, it is also the case that individuals who um, indicate that earnings are important to them choose fields that uh, have a higher wage level. 
it is also the case that people who um, indicate that pleasant working hours are important to them tend to eschew fields uh, with heavy overwork norms. Um, it's only the case that I don't find these differences with regards to parents' approval, but then we also saw that you know, there wasn't much of a variation in the first place, and the vari variation that we saw was a bit of a mess, not much related to the theories. Okay, but this is still preliminary. So we see that most of the mechanisms are potentially in place. Now I jump to um, the mediation-based uh, decomposition. And what this does is really to start off from a baseline model, which translates the, the macro finding that I showed you in the very first slide. You know, the fact that we do see that women and men tend to choose different fields of study. We can translate this into the individualistic logic of um, the conditional logic model, of the choice model. And this translates into, um, you know, that with each additional percentage of females in a, in a college, women are more strongly attracted to that field than men are. This is basically what's captured in this coefficient. And what I'm now doing is um, I'm adding the substantive mechanisms to this baseline model, not sequentially because we don't have a clear causal story behind this, but if we had a clear causal story, that would be wonderful, but we don't. So I'm throwing in the individual variables, but also the, the, the groups of variables to see how much of that is mediated when throwing in these groups of variables. Now, this, <clears throat> this sort of gives us the upper limit because all the other variables are not in the model. I'm also doing the reverse and so, sort of giving, giving us low, lower bounds of the, um, uh, the proportion explained by withdrawing groups of variables from the full model. Um, this is, I'm just showing this to you to explain you the basic logic of the mediation analysis. This sums it all up. Um, so all of the variables taken together only explain a little less than half of the variation we see. And by far, the largest part is explained by gender vocational interests. So uh, this is sort of the big one of the, maybe the big conclusion um, I would draw is that this preference-based essentialist theory really rules, rules here. Um, <clears throat> The norms-based version of essentialism explains a little bit, but far less than the preference-based version, whereas more or less all the other theories um, explain hardly anything at all. But we should also remember that you know, the glass is half, half empty as well, and that all these theories taken together, and I think I've, I've drawn on quite a broad range of theories, only explain about half. Now, in the discussion, we may discuss why that is. I think this kind of uh, mechanistic design that I've used here is quite harsh because, you know, actually the variation has to travel all the way from X to Y through these channels and all the functional misspecifications that happen along the route, they take away explanatory power. But okay, I see that I'm running out of time. I also want to um, mention that this analysis has considerable weaknesses. You might have uh, spotted them already. First of all, something you couldn't spot is that um, the measures for, nor for, for social norms are really uncertain. So there are substantial standard errors around these differences between men and women. Um, and yeah, yeah, this is a cautionary, cautionary uh, statement I, I want to make about that. This could become better once the starting code five of the starting code four of NEPS moves into college and they are potentially asked the same items and then we have more responses on that and possibly get more certainty about, about these measures. Second, um, I was assuming here that individuals are sort of taking their decision for college majors in a two-step fashion. First, they decide to go to college and then they pick a field of study. Whereas in reality, it could be that you know they're trading off um, college options with non-college options. You know, in Germany, vocational tracks can be quite um, appealing. And um, these are these, these non-academic tracks are not, are not observed here. And, and that may be problematic if people are not actually proceeding in this two-step fashion. And what is quite important, and this is also something I've pointed out very explicitly in the paper, is that um, in, in my design here, vocational interests 
were, were measured very early on when in the in college so when people had already declared their their majors and this is a problem because people may just post hoc rationalize the decision that they already made and you may you may want to argue about this and this is this could be the case so i've looked at um, um, psychological research about how stable these vocational interests are and they tend to be quite stable and i do think it's kind of unlikely that people totally reinterpret their preferences between um, you know the time when they actually designated the major and afterwards but this is could potentially be true so i i measured interests at the time when people had declared their major and i'm assuming that there's a really strong causal connection between the interests that they had before declaring the major and the and the and their interest that they have when they when they are already in college which would allow me, which I, I'm assuming allows me to control for the interests at time point A by measuring interests at time point B. But this, if there is a lot of post hoc rationalization, then, and there's a causal effect of the major you've declared on the interests you state, then this is a collider variable, and if I condition on it, it opens this backdoor path and it messes up my, my whole results. This is why I think it would be really desirable to um, replicate this analysis. And I see two opportunities coming very soon to, to do that. Um, one is the net starting port 5, that at some point in time, a fraction of that will go into college. And for these, we, we, we will have um, interests already measured before they entered college. And the second is actually this already exists, is the um, his student berechtigten panels where vocational interests are also asked briefly before, um, so in the last years of college, uh, no, the last years of high school, sorry. So this will also um, allow us to replicate this analysis. Unfortunately, the history and Berechtigten panel cannot be accessed by external researchers yet, but I hear that they're building up a research center and this should be possible soon. Um, my syntax for the entire analysis I've made available online, so you can go online and exactly replicate the kind of design that I did here with these data sets once they become available. And hopefully my results hold up, but if not, publish it and then I have to think again, and we all do. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. Just a question on understanding there was this item um, regarding social norms where friend just that a friend is I think he's done a good job. Was there anything like well excluding friends you know from the study in that video? No. no. It is that nature. Yeah. So um this I think um if I remember correctly, um, I'm quite sure that this comes from the first wave of um, starting quad five, and this is close to the first um, when when people had just started their studies. So my hope is that you know the way people interpret this item is thinking about the friends they had when they cho choose it, choose their field, and they don't ha they haven't made a lot of friends yet in their in their um, college. But that's right. That's another potential problem. Um, you made an argument that um, people may adapt their interests to, to their um, field of study, um, uh, but uh, the argument um, about non-rational expectations may also be true for um, or things like the workload and, and the, the things you will have to do and be able to do in the field of study and in the, in the working place later. Because when people make their decisions about what field to study, um, they don't really have uh, information about what's, um, what's it going to be like. They, they just have their prejudices uh, about a certain field. And, um, try to make their choices depending on, on this. And there could also be a, a bias 
because you you you, you use data from from people uh, in the workforce, um, and this is not the same. But people before choosing something um, might expect. Yeah. So let me break down this uh, comment into two parts. So what you stated is absolutely true. I have this assumption that through whatever channels these are, you know, social networks, parents, um, um, youngsters hear about the, the, the experiences that older persons who are already in the labor market have made, and this sort of travels to them, and they, they make rational decisions about, for instance, the degree of discrimination across fields. Um, <clears throat> that's true. I'm, I'm making this assumption, but I think it's, for instance, with regards to discrimination, it's fair to make this assumption because this is the assumption that is usually made in the theory, right? So whenever we hear this argument that, you know, the labor market needs to be, or, or, or um, so I've heard this argument often that this is why women ask you for, for uh, or shy away from studying engineering because they know that this is such a machist, just a work environment and they don't want this work culture. It's not expressed in these terms, but this is also making this rationalist uh, assumption. So yes, I'm making this assumption. The second point you brought up was um, about the workload or the difficulty of tasks. I didn't quite get that. For me, workload was just an example of potentially irrational expectations. Okay, so then... I don't really have a question for that. Uh, when you uh, differentiate, uh, well, the main goal I think is that you want to differentiate between the uh, yeah, concerns and uh, kind of like the pre preferences. Or uh, if it's if you study a specific field because uh, it's difficult and because it's expected of you, or if you have an intrinsic preference for that. And when you come with a, um, when you mentioned that. Uh, People don't know something and they update it because of uh, the experience or if you study they, they can only update the constraints, but they won't update uh, their own preferences and the social norms. I mean, the social norms share the environment. They don't go to university and, and, and learn that uh, the norms are different than they expected. Yeah. I guess so that, that would be a thing if you can use the uh, information how many women and then switch fields, switch the model to another separate uh, the part of the constraints yeah. and the actual uh, social norms. Yes. Because that would be stable. They only switch completely because of the updated knowledge about constraints. So um, you're not referring to switching fields. Do you mean people who have already started studying and then they, they drop out of a college major and they move to another one? Or are you thinking about the choice in general? The actual uh, switch of fields. You go to uh, sociology because you, think it, you don't have to know anything about statistics and mathematics, mm -hmm. and then you switch because there is statistics and math, yeah. uh, or uh, which would be an updating constraints, yeah. independent of social norms. Yeah. No, that's right. I'm I'm not looking specifically yeah, at switches. Yes, we do the data probably. Switches, yeah. But yeah, no, that's right. So switches would be. A specific group where you could test certain assumptions more explicitly, right? I mean, the rest, uh, yeah, I guess strongly rest on the, the that your assumptions ah. on which indicator fits to which stock. Yeah, that's true. With the with, with the switches, if assignment, uh, this indicator, this component, then the picture is yeah. completely different. Again. Yeah. No, you're right. The switches would allow me to relax this rationalist yeah. assumption a lot. Yes, that's true. Um, you now focus on just college majors. Have you thought about extending it because in Germany at least we have all this detailed vocational training system where there's also very different interests are expressed in choices of vocational fields. Do you know whether there's any data available that would allow you to do something similar for that population? Because it's very large population as well. It may even be possible to look at both. Yes, um, well, I, I couldn't give you like, the, the perfect data to, to do that from the top of my head, but I would think that the NEPS starting code 4 will turn into something like this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it could be done if we then, I think you would have to rearrange the analysis a little bit and only look at occupations. And sort of, this becomes a bit complicated because it's like a direct selection into an occupation if you choose the vocational track. Mm -hmm but it's an indirect selection into an occupation if you choose the academic track. But this can be done, sort of getting the same occupational characteristics from, from, from the BIP data, for example, and then converting the occupational information into college major information by sort of, uh, because we know the trajectories that lead from certain college majors into certain occupations, and then you could redo the analysis with the whole range of options, both academic and non-academic available. This can be done. I have, um, so like you hear, I, I, I can think of it. Uh, I, I'm not going to do it just now. <laughs> yeah, of course, we'll take a lot of time. Maybe even the vocational training occupations in Germany have already been classified according to the education training. There are classifications for that available in principle that should apply to both higher education as well as yeah. But then, you know, to, so I think the reason why, you know, despite all the empirical um, deficits that this paper has, why I still do like it is more from a conceptual perspective, you know, looking at these kind of uh, social norms or, or anticipated discrimination, which are theories that are flying around a lot in our discourse, but that are re really rarely tested because they're hard to test. And I, I think I got lucky by finding these items. Now you would also have to find all these items for occupations and for the occupation level. And that can, I don't know, you would have to do some search to that, I think. I have a comment on how you measured how easy it would be to combine family life and work. You said uh, you looked at how many hours full-time employees have to work and you didn't have a lot of uh, variation in that. And I was just thinking maybe it's difficult to combine uh, work with full-time employment and it would be also interesting to look how big the share is that work only part-time. Yeah. Or how easy it would be to work from home or Yes. So, yeah, that's that's right. Um, and for instance, look at the wage penalty for part-time work. That could be something. Wage penalty for um, taking a break. Something like that. Yes. Um, to be honest, I thought of this. I think my you could use both measures, but I actually. I'm convinced that I, I, I tend to think that my measure is more realistic. I think that um, sort of these overwork cultures are characterized by those who work full time having to work an awful lot. And the share of part time workers in an occupation, for instance, I think is not so good a measure because it, it Again, it gives away a lot of, it's, it's driven largely by self-selection, I would argue, that people who want to work part-time, most of the times in Germany, will find a way to work part-time. Now, we could look at the cost, but I think to look at the frequency of part-time work is strongly at, uh, determined by self-selection, not so much by, you know, the work culture that you're seeing there. And I... I, I tend to be skeptical, or, or um, I think the, the empirical evidence for this kind of sequential idea of combining work and family, you know, how easy is it to go out of the labor market and then back in for women, or how costly is it? Um, first of all, empirically, this has not fared too well in, in, the, in the occupational literature to explain occupational uh, sex segregation. And second, I think it, it doesn't really match awfully well with um, with the interests and the situation that highly educated women of a very recent cohort in Germany are facing, where it's more about combining work and family at the same time, rather than in a sequential pattern. 
And there, I think these overworked ones are really important. What about the millions of uh, online viewers? Don't tell me there aren't millions. <laughs> I can read that. <laughs> okay. I actually have two specific questions. Uh, one the indicator you have uh, on preferences, where I would argue that it's more constrained. Uh, Which ones? You have this, uh, There's a big one. You expected a need map. This one? So it's for, uh, yeah. Question, do you need map? And I guess I answered it. You interpret this as a preference. No, 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 no. Um, no, no, no. This is a this is a college characteristic, a major a, a major characteristic. Sorry. And the preference that matches this would be this okay. and this. So if you're someone who, especially this, if if you're someone who has strong analytical vocational interests. You are likely to sort into electrical engineering, or math, or computer science, or chemistry, but you're not that likely to, to do arts, or law, or pedagogy, or history and philosophy. That's the basic idea. Yeah, I'm willing to defend it, so why, why, why? <coughs> No, 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 that's not the indicator. That's vocational interests in general. You know, these are, yeah, these are these kinds of items. And I think it's quite straightforward that, you know, for, uh, for instance, people were asking how much they're interested in helping others and looking after kids or stuff like this. And then if we, and we do expect that people who state these kinds of interests, stuff that they, in, they enjoy doing that, it's kind of likely that they will end up in social work rather than electrical engineering. Another thing is that uh, your know, regression treatment of the ratio where you uh, extend the decomposition and the change in the alteration effects. Yeah. Uh, you know that there's this problem with the neglected, neglected heterogeneity that is yeah. this problem. You also have it here because you have the fixed. Uh, residual variance in the logistic regression. Yeah, that's right. It's constant across the models. So you compare coefficients across models and get changes because you change. That's true, yeah. Uh, but you can use the copy, the cards on. I can use it for this, too? Okay. Just the necessary the probability model. Really so, although I, it's true that I pretty much ignored this, I, I ignored this problem. Um, I think what what helps a little bit here is that they I constructed these upper and lower bounds that I have the full model from which I remove variables. So the full model, no, it doesn't. Okay. But shouldn't the by I mean, shouldn't there be when when adding the the, the 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 variables, the bias should go in one direction, and when removing the variables, the bias should go in the other direction. And this this side of sort of upper bounds is then based on on one sort of bias, and the other on the on the second sort of bias. That's actually not a bias. It's just a kind of uh, how how good you are. To explain kind of like the, the utility. Okay. Okay. There are no further questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the discussion. And thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.